um, responsible for um, for uh, treaty European and Mediterranean major hazards agreement. We are working on hazards in the Council of Europe, and um, but also environment. And I think um, that we could get some inspiration from uh, what the people in the cultural heritage are doing. You know, they have, of course, this blue shield treaty, but it is not just this treaty that has been signed has but not or ratified by enough number of countries. But the fact that when there is conflict, you know, they go to NATO and say, look, you cannot bomb there. For instance, in the recent conflict with Libya, and I know this because there was a conference in the uh, Korea Museum about a year ago about uh, you know, uh, heritage in, in conflict, both natural disasters and war, you know, they had uh, given all NATO the military, you know, the military of uh, of NATO had been given by uh, their own uh, authorities, you know, precise areas, plants, sites that could not be hit by all the bombing. And mm, they, they managed to avoid all, uh, for instance, all World Heritage sites or sites of importance. You know. I think if we could uh, also convince our own um, NATO government when they're bombing somewhere, you know, that. Uh, uh, also, there are you know, all these protected areas, all these interesting places for for uh, conservation of biodiversity should be avoided. I think that that's also a possibility for us to act without any further treaties. You know how long treaties take to long with violence. Thank you. Um, the last uh, question or comment. I uh, I want to try to introduce something that maybe will work or not to work what you're doing is amazing and very important but to maybe um, look at a parallel avenue that you could pursue at the same time that may eliminate what you do now hopefully in a longer term kind of approach that would be building the understanding of the hierarchy of security most of these conflicts are really done in the name of security and as long as we're still believing that of course within our communities it is illegal to kill anybody but in international conflict it is still legal to, to use violent uh, conflict resolutions as a legal means of solving it but if we can raise our um, understanding of what is security and the ultimate in the hierarchy of security it is ecological security that is actually going to help anybody who is a stakeholder in these kind of conflicts. How can we, I mean, it is really true what you say, but in fact, anything we hit in, in this kind of um, conflict, it, it is a huge loss and there is no gain in security. So how can we um, pursue as IUCN that yes, we want security, but it is ecological security that will ultimately be what we should be pursuing. Michael? Yeah, th these are all uh, very challenging questions mm -hmm. and uh, well to point. Um, uh, I think uh, the first, first two speakers have raised the question of non-state actors, you said non-state actors, you said that the rebels are killing the animal, animals, here we are. Um, now that this is a, 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 a one of the most difficult uh, and uh, partly unresolved questions of the law of armed conflict. Um, the how to engage the non-state actors. The, 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 the problem is, the, the community is aware of the problem, which is an important first step. And there are different ways of dealing with them. There are technical arguments, how can you make sure uh, that uh, the non-state party to a conflict is bound. Uh, uh, a very important uh, issue of human rights, uh, for instance. Uh, how are, are they bound and why and to which extent uh, by, tr by the law uh, prohibiting uh, bad treatment of detainees? Um, 
So that there's first of all a, a technical, legal technical aspect to that. Um, the second point is um, uh, the point of making the rebel side uh, internalize what the law says. So there is a dissemination and education process. Now, don't tell me you don't reach the, the rebels. We have uh, the specialists who know how to reach them. Uh, this, this is possible. It's a little bit difficult. You have to know that the Colombian FARC has a fax address in Geneva. Right? Uh, so this is, it, it, it is perhaps not relevant what the, the example, but uh, I give the example to say that there are ways and means to reach the rebels and to disseminate and make them internalize the rules. Uh, and that is very important. It, it go, goes much beyond the technical question, are they legally bound or not? Uh, what does it help if, they, if we think they are bound and they don't even know what the rule is? So dissemination and education is a very important point. And then I have you a, a last encouraging example. And that is an organization called Geneva Corps. And uh, they have a program on uh, the prohibition of the use of mines. So this is very close to where we are. Uh, how do they approach it? They approach the parties to a conflict, be they states or be they rebels, and say, well, this is a bad thing. Why do you not enter into a contract with us? Benevolent organization Geneva call not to use these things and declare yourself open to inspection by us Geneva call. Now, you may see this is improbable. It has happened. It has happened in the Philippines. There was a mission by Geneva call in the Philippines looking into the question of the use, of, of alleged use, of mines there. So there, there is a potential, but uh, it is difficult. Now, the question of cultural heritage. Um, of course, uh, first, cultural heritage is threatened, and Libya is not the only example. We have had terrible destructions of cultural heritage during the Yugoslav conflict in the early 90s, uh, destruction of whole sites. Unlawful, but uh, this is a very important thing. However, uh, this is the protection of sites along the lines of the, uh, the Hague Convention on the Protection of Property, uh, Cultural Property during the conflict. And this would also apply uh, to any application of the Heritage Convention, UNESCO Heritage Convention during armed conflict, which we think applies during armed conflict. Uh, that is the question of loss of protection. You know, in the, uh, in the Hague Convention, you have rules on loss of protection. And I gave you examples of loss of protection if these things become too military, they lose their protection. It's as simple as that. Uh, and no state will tolerate the missile launching sites on top of a protected cultural heritage. It just does not win. And uh, what is therefore necessary, both for the purpose of preserving cultural heritage and for the purpose of preserving the environment, is to prevent that from happening. Uh, I'm very grateful for this longer term perspective. I think you're absolutely right. Um, there has been a, a, a big discussion about environmental security, ecological security. So 
the issues of gender, but um, I'm afraid we are not yet there. But we uh, sh shall certainly not lose uh, sight of a question which could be called the uh, preservation of peace through environmental protection. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think with that, we would like to shift gears. Um, and I'll hand over the role of the chair to Professor Bowen. Yeah, um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Carl. Um, indeed, this is a, a very intriguing subject and uh, very relevant practically. And uh, therefore, uh, the, the group, with the cooperation of a lot of other actors involved has engaged in a series of state of uh, case studies on the use of the environment uh, of, of the rehabilitation of the environment that is part of a peace promotion process. And uh, Carl will introduce uh, this, and then we will uh, hear about a one of these case studies. So, Carl, you have it. Thank you. Um, in many ways, this is the sequel, the temporally, to what uh, um, Wolfgang and Michael have just been talking about. I'd like to start just with a brief uh, overview of some of the linkages between natural resources and conflict. Uh, natural resources often contribute to conflict through scarcity, inequitable sharing of benefits, environmental degradation, poor public participation, lack of dispute resolution, and so forth. Natural res once conflict starts, natural resources often finance and sustain conflict. If, um, we see all sorts of ways of natural resources supporting the financing of conflict, and that then generates a change in logic of the conflict around uh, capturing resources, capturing territory, and it becomes a motivation for recruitment. With that, we get an additional motivation for targeting natural resource and environment conflict. Sometimes it's because uh, combatants are taking cover. Sometimes it's because this is a valuable resource. And sometimes it's because you're just kind of sticking your eye in the uh, other side, you know, that this land is considered sacred. And so anything you can do to damage that is uh, all fair is all fair in love of war. Naturally, all of this means that when you actually get a peace agreement and you're trying to build peace, sure. that there are many ways that natural resources, if they're not addressed, can spoil the peace building process through vested interests, um, challenges in the actual negotiation peace agreements, and the long-term damage caused by the conflict. Between 1989 and 2000, at least 18 conflicts were financed by different natural resources, at least in part. 89 is important because that is the end of the Cold War. With the end of the Cold War, you had a, a rapid drop in financing for the proxy. Governments often had tax bases they could use. But rebel groups had to look around. And they started exploiting diamonds, timber, ivory, whatever valuable resources they could find. Sometimes they exploited it directly, and sometimes they taxed the trade. Literally, any resource that provides a revenue stream provides a revenue stream that can be tapped into for financing conflict. Over the last 60 years, in any particular year, at least 40% of internal armed conflicts were linked to natural resources. In some years, it was as much as 60%. We're starting to learn, though. From 89 to 2005, only about half of the peace agreements addressed natural resources in any way. Often, the natural resources were controversial. The, this, the people are the part of the grievances are over land. And that's a really hot topic. And the, the temptation of 
peace negotiators is to put the hot topics aside and let's see where we can find common agreement. Well, the problem is you never resolve the really hot topics. Surprise, surprise, you get relapse. We're seeing since 2005, every major peace agreement addresses natural resources. It addresses it in multiple ways. It addresses multiple resources in multiple ways. Slowly, the Security Council is starting to give explicit mandates to peacekeeping forces to address natural resources. And we're starting to look more broadly, not only at uh, post-conflict states, but at fragile states. Of the 45 fragile states highlighted by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in 2011, 91% contain transboundary waters, the globally significant biodiversity hotspots. And 80% contain high value resources of global economic importance. Just, I, I want to give a few vignettes, a few pictures to illustrate what we're talking about. And, if, and these are um, courtesy of UNEP, one of the partners in the project. In Afghanistan, from 77 to 2002, there is a dramatic destruction of the forest. Some of this was uh, for livelihoods to um, get charcoal or energy. Some of it was uh, for um, uh, depriving um, cover. These used to be pistachio plantations. Where the vast majority of the population depends on agriculture for livelihoods, <coughs> water and land are cited as the top sources of disputes. In the 1991 Gulf War, more than 600 oil wells were set on fire, ostensibly, purportedly, for military purposes, to provide a shield so that the uh, um, allied forces could not see the uh, international community viewed it otherwise. Between 300 and 1,500 tons of depleted uranium were used against Iraq in 91 and 2003. And 311 industrial sites were at risk following the 2003 invasion often from looting. We saw following the 1991 conflict, an uprising of the Marsh Arabs, which led to the um, redirection of the river, drying up more than 85% of the Mesopotamian marshlands. In Liberia, revenues from both timber and diamonds finance the conflict. And this was the first peacekeeping mission that received an explicit mandate to administer natural resources. Moreover, the conflict drove 800,000 Liberians to flee their homes, with half of those living in camps creating major pressures on local resources, land, water, timber, wildlife. In Lebanon, the bombing of the Gia power plant, again, ostensibly for military purposes as a, I think it was asserted to be a dual use facility, yes, yes, yes. led to an oil slate along the Eastern Mediterranean. We also saw a problem with rubble. Much of the war led to this destruction of large sections of the city. And as part of the um, uh, cleaning up process, you had to get rid of the rubble before you could rebuild. Problem is, the rubble had a lot of asbestos and other hazardous substances. About 65,000 tons was screened for hazardous waste it, it is, it, and asbestos. It was a very promising effort. Problem is, there were about <coughs> five, almost six million cubic meters of waste, of rubble. And most of that was just dumped 
a lot of it into the Mediterranean. In Sudan, the post-conflict reconstruction process led to an increased demand for wood and water. In Sierra Leone, diamonds played a substantial role in financing the conflict, with rebels receiving approximately 25 to 125 million dollars a year, smuggled primarily through Liberia. And after the conflict, the government has been struggling to generate revenues. And part of that has been through the sale of concessions. Approximately 10 to 20 percent of the of the land, of the agricultural land in like Sierra Leone is under contract for a negotiation for agribusiness. And approximately 80% of the country has some form of concession for mining, mineral exploration or exploitation. Do the math. Where's everyone else living? In DRC, coltan, diamonds, and gold finances state the conflict in Eastern DRC. But it's not just a question of getting at the non-state actors. A lot of the people 